Hello everyone, welcome to Be Waste Wise. I am Shweta, I am the community builder at Be Waste Wise. What we do at Be Waste Wise is we try to make knowledge accessible all over the world. We try to make experts available all over the world and we believe that uh, having this knowledge accessible will make a real change in actions that people can make in their own communities. Uh, today, we're going to talk about uh, extended producer responsibility regulations in Latin America. Vishwas Vidyaranya, who's the founder of Ambire Environmental Engineering Solutions, is the moderator today. He's going to be talking to Alejandro Martinez, who's a circular economy expert. We also have Carolina Palacio of, from Diego. There's uh, Mike, who's a managing partner at Inclusive Waste Recycling Consortium. And Rodrigo Newman, who is an environmental consultant at Valeriza Environmental Advisors. Just a reminder before I'm going to hand this to Vishwas, uh, we did receive your questions that you had put in along with the registrations that's been passed on to the panel. But apart from that, please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A section. Vishwas will pick and choose the questions whenever they are relevant in the conversation and he will pose them to the panelists. And do not worry if your questions are not answered today. When we put the webinar up on our website in two weeks, we'll ensure that the panelists have responded to your questions and it'll go up on our website. And uh, since we have, we have four panelists of other than Vishwas today, we're going to extend this to slightly more than an hour. So stay tuned and uh, over to you, Vishwas. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shweta, for the invitation and thank you, Be Waste Wise. Uh, I've been following Be Waste Wise for many years now, and it's an absolute pleasure to moderate a session, uh, especially with the, panel, with the panel of such high expertise and experience in Latin America and on the topic. Uh, as Shweta mentioned, I'm, I'm Vishwas. I am the co-founder of Ambire Environmental Engineering Solutions based out of Bogota, Colombia. We work in circular economy, climate change, and environmental engineering. Uh, with us, we have today four experts. So we'll be running through the story of EPR in the region from starting from Colombia, then move to Brazil, Chile, and Argentina. And uh, we'll see the diverse aspects of EPR and how the region is moving ahead. So, you know, before we start off with the webinar, in order to just give you a little context, because we have audience from across the world. Uh, so Latin America generates about, about 150,000 tons of, uh, sorry, 550,000 tons of waste per day and has a per capita generation of approximately one kilogram per person per day, which is slightly, which is continuously increasing. And the recycling rates are different. Uh, it varies right, from 1% to 17%, for example, in Colombia. And every time we talk about Latin America across the world, the first thing we, uh, that comes to our mind is the successful integration of informal sector into waste management, into the formal system in several countries. So the informal sector also plays a very key role in several countries in the region. And uh, today, throughout the webinar, we are going to speak about two important concepts, which I think is important for everyone to know. First is, of course, the EPR. EPR means Extended Producer Responsibility. Uh, just to give a context, EPR is basically a um, policy instrument uh, or an environmental policy approach where we are saying the producer is responsible for managing the materials of waste. Because all in several, typically in several countries or in several cities, the municipalities have to deal with uh, the problem of waste or the materials and they don't know how to do with it, do you, how to deal with it. So the idea is something like a polluter prey principle where the producers are responsible for managing this waste. And the second concept is PRO. PRO is basically the producer responsibility organization. Now, in many of these cases, the producers, for example, are not waste management companies. They do not have technical capability or even the logistics capability to manage waste. So they form these organizations called PROs. PROs can be funded by either one producer or a group of producers, and they are in charge of all the reverse logistics, collection, recycling, so that you know they help the producers meet their EPR targets. So these are the two important concepts that we'll talk about, that we'll hear a lot today. And uh, so we can jump into our panel. Uh, first panelist is, today is Alejandro Martinez 
from Colombia. Uh, I've known Alejandro also for many years now. He's a good friend. Alejandro has over two decades of experience in circular economy and waste management. And he's one of the most uh, well-known faces uh, in this field in Colombia. He's authored several publications and books. He's part of International Solid Waste Association. He's also the member of uh, steering committee of the Colombian Council for Sustainable Construction. He's also part of the C2C. He's the director of the C2C hub. And he has actually contributed for the first ever certification of the cradle to cradle product in Latin America in 2019. Uh, thank you, Alejandro. It's a pleasure. Please um, uh, take over from here to brief us about Colombia. Thanks, my friend. Uh, nice, nice, uh, uh, good space for to dialogue. Uh, I want to, to, to express some ideas about uh, the story and the history of the of, of the, the laws and, and uh, regulations around this topic and well uh, i want to 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 talk it off uh, with you and with the with the participants well maybe in the beginning i want to to show with you a uh, one um, a possibility for to for to for to, for to talk about extended producer responsibility in Colombian situation really in, in, in the Colombian area really uh, I want to I want to um, to, to uh, talk around the the, the begin the begin the, the brief story maybe uh, is is uh, in, the, in the past <laughs> century in uh, 1974 with the national code of, of renewable uh, natural resource and environmental protection is really uh, one of the of the main uh, um, national codes or, or politics and um, at this moment uh, many years <laughs> uh, after uh, some of the of the articles uh, are uh, are uh, in vigency ready after of this maybe in, in this century uh, the decreto um, 4741 uh, from uh, from 15 years ago hazardous waste and guidelines uh, for correct management. Uh, uh, all the, the board uh, of this, uh, the law and, and the decret uh, was compiled in the Decreto uh, 1076 from 2015. And well, it, it is the, 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 the big uh, uh, landscape, but uh, the, really, the really new movement around the extended producer responsibility was, was uh, really recent in the more or less the last uh, five, eight, maybe ten years, the post-consumer waste norms uh, was begin with the with the hazardous uh, waste or the special waste as pesticide containers uh, in, in 2013, expired medications in 29, uh, used lead acid batteries uh, or uh, uh, cars batteries. Uh, in 29, um, waste alkaline batteries use tires like bulk waste and waste electrical and uh, electrical and electronic equipment uh, waste more or less. And uh, all of these uh, activities around these hazardous or special waste uh, create a good environment for to for to talk uh, about Colombia uh, as a model for waste management in, in Latin America maybe. Uh, and uh, at this moment, more than uh, uh, one Alejandro, thousand... Alejandro, sorry, sorry? I uh, just wanted to know if you are sharing your screen by any chance. Ah, okay, maybe that's good. Sorry, we, uh, we cannot see. That's perfect. That's just great. Thank you. Maybe, maybe for this, that's good. Uh, if you know, if you know um, more than uh, 100 to uh, 1,200 producers are linked. Uh, to EPR processes at this moment with all the regulations uh, more than uh, uh, 18,000 tons uh, from uh, electronic waste, light bulb, pesticide containers, uh, expired medications uh, are managed uh, or was were managed according with the regulations. Um, at this moment, more than uh, 16 million units of tires and car batteries uh, used, used car batteries handled correctly. Uh, and uh, with 
all of this movement with the with the hazardous and special ways, we have a very uh, high promotion uh, of the sector linked with the EPR. And in, uh, in Colombia, increase uh, the capacity was the capability and, and, the, and the capacity, the historic capacity in, in, uh, in terms of industrial uh, processes and user uh, processes. And the last movement maybe was the, compass, the national policy for the integral management of, of waste. And the COMPES is, is the name in Spanish, uh, 3874 uh, for, uh, from four years ago. Uh, that this uh, national policy talk about prevention, minimization, uh, promotion of their use, uh, and it's the first time that uh, that in Colombia uh, we use the circular economy concept. Yeah, uh, and the other movements, uh, the compass or another compass, uh, the policy about green growth uh, policy. Really, um, uh, two years ago we have. Uh, strong initiatives around the bioeconomy and the circular economy in, in, in others in others uh, in others ways and and we have a lot of uh, big movement around the reuse and recycling of beverage and food containers and at this moment packaging this is the this is the the, the real big challenge now and i want to i want to 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 put the the, the final point with this uh, short presentation uh, with, with the main message really is, hey, we, we, we began with the hazardous, with the, with the um, special materials, but now we are maybe for, 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 for me, maybe late, but well, uh, that's good. Uh, now we are work, uh, uh, working in the, in the way of the packaging and the, the massive waste, the massive product waste. And it is a, a big challenge, really. Uh, now the, the, the laws are uh, uh, in, the, in the beginning of, of all the process. Uh, all the community, the, the entrepreneurship uh, community and the, and the companies and the industry uh, are beginning all the process for to create the EPR uh, process with packaging and with the, the containers. It is it is my the context that I want to 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 present with you, and uh, I want to to talk more uh, about uh, something things. Uh, tell me, Ivish. Thank you, Alejandro. That's that's very interesting to know the transition of Colombia from hazardous waste to packaging waste in terms of EPR laws. Uh, I'm sure uh, we have a lot of questions for you, and also I'm sure uh, if if the audience have questions, please post it there. But we'll come back to you later with the questions. Uh, so we'll move uh, now to the presentation of uh, Michael. Uh, Mike is basically um, the head of IWRC, which is the Inclusive Waste Recycling Consortium. He has headed several sustainability pro portfolios some of, for some of the biggest companies in the world, including the, le uh, the latest was Johnson & Johnson, where he served as the vice president uh, for global engineering and packaging. So Mike also brings a, diff, a whole, whole different approach. He understands the producer point of view. He has a lot of experience in the supply chain. And with IWC, uh, what is very interesting is they've worked uh, extensively with waste workers in Brazil and in India, and they have included uh, social accountability or social audits, which are often missing in a lot of these waste management initiatives. Uh, welcome, Mike, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you today. Uh, so I'll just share the screen. Uh, Great, thank you, Vish. Okay, can everyone see the screen? Great, there we go, perfect. Okay, um, good day everyone or good evening, uh, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, so today I'm gonna talk a little bit about the national policy on solid waste uh, in Brazil, which is also called the, in, in short, PNRS. Uh, and, and basically this is an extended producer responsibility initiative. Um, it, it's intention, uh, was to connect manufacturers, importers, distributors, uh, traders, and consumers through solid waste management, uh, re really with the attempt to minimize the volume of solid waste 
um, and, and reduce the environmental and social impacts resulting from uh, product life cycle to human health and, and environmental um, quality. Um, it was viewed as an economic and social development, uh, which is really great. You know, they really thought through uh, the policy from, from the three pillars of sustainability, the environmental, the economic, and the social development. And, and they defined this by a, a set of actions and procedures uh, were, were, which were meant to facilitate the collection and recovery of solid waste uh, for the manufacturers, for their reuse in their supply chains and or other production cycles, um, or for the environmentally sound disposal. So again, I think two sides. One, the, in, the increase of the uh, reuse in supply chains, um, or it accounted for environmentally sound disposal. Um, the PNRS was finally uh, implemented by the Brazilian government um, in 2010. Um, and I'll go through a timeline later, uh, but it was an effort to regulate the activities of the solid waste sector in Brazil. Um, the policy provides for cooperation among stakeholders, uh, the three levels of government, federal, state, and municipal, uh, the recycling and packaging industries, society and recyclable materials collectors, and the, the informal sector uh, was specifically written into the uh, PNRS and is, is a major section uh, that, that can't be overlooked. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, in, in order to fulfill its objectives and, and the recommendations, they built in nine basic requirements. Uh, one is products definition. Uh, two is the life cycle and logistics. Um, three is how to operationalize. So each uh, uh, stakeholder has to have an operational plan. Um, the participation of collectors, uh, municipalities, consumers, um, a communication strategy, um, and then uh, quantitative and regional goals, and then finally the financial impact uh, that each stakeholder was facing in order to, to roll out the PNRS. Um, number four, again, uh, the participation of the collectors um, is, is a really important topic in the inclusion of these recyclable material collectors or waste pickers or catadores in Brazil, uh, rag pickers in India. Um, you know, the, the actions that involve shared responsibilities uh, recognize that they're, they're a very important part of the life cycle. So, so what does this mean exactly? So in summary, the PNRS, PNRS is an innovative uh, policy that links socioeconomic issues to environmental issues. Uh, the reality of waste management um, at, the, at the city level prior to PNRS left a lot to be desired in both uh, respects. Um, so what was the federal government trying to do? Uh, number one, eradication of landfills um, that were slowly overtaking Brazil. Um, incentivizing waste sorting at all levels. Uh, the participation of recyclable materials collectors in the process. Again, uh, this important part of the strategy said that, or the regulation says, you can't go around the waste collectors. You have to involve them as part of your strategy. Um, support for strategies that promote recycling at the federal level. And then finally, uh, you know, a focus on final waste disposal for those products that couldn't be recycled uh, via sanitary landfills, provided there was a, an energetic return. Uh, during the implementation of the PNRS, there were three points of focus that really became the heart of the discussion. Um, the first was reverse logistics. So it wasn't enough just to, uh, you know, understand the, you know, the basic waste transaction. It really became, how do you look at the reverse logistics, um, the forms of collecting, and then how to reinsert solid waste in the business sector for re reuse or, or adequate disposal. Uh, there's a specific article, Article 15, uh, the reverse logistics systems will be implemented and operationalized by uh, one of three legal instruments, uh, one, sectoral agreements, uh, two, executive decrees, and then number three, uh, a terms of commitment. Um, so these three things became, uh, you know, part of the regulation and was driving um, uh, the, the reverse logistics. Um, one of the main aspects of PNRS um, is, the, is the elaboration of these reverse logistic plans, um, which included the packaging industry. Um, and the packaging industry was really a driving force uh, in hey, the early um, years of- 
Hey Mike, I'm very sorry to interrupt. Uh, do you want to tell Vishwas when he's going to move the slides ahead? I, I you know, I only built one slide and then I was oh. I was just talking. So there is All only right. one slide. Sounds good. I think that's information for everyone. <laughs> okay, good. Um, so, so again, in, in 2015, um, an agreement was signed such that the packaging sector would support municipal uh, initiatives um, and provide cost sharing between companies um, and municipal governments um, for the management of uh, any discarded packaging waste. Um, in, in this way, one really important thing was fulfilled as far as one of the objectives was the shared responsibility. So the packaging sector really led, uh, you know, led the sectoral agreements um, and, and created the, you know, the basic concept of the shared responsibility, which was the part of the intention of the, the solid waste policy. Um, the second part was the sectoral agreements, and these are contracts between public authorities and manufacturers um, that help determine the shared responsibility of the product life cycles. Uh, these formal contracts were signed by the government, um, and then each sector in turn, whether they are manufacturers, uh, importers, or distributors, um, each had a sh shared responsibility as part of the product life cycle. Um, the public Public authorities had the responsibility to implement waste policy um, and programs at the at the three levels, the federal, the state, and the local. Um, waste generators had a, a, an obligation to implement the waste management plans. Um, and then manufacturers, importers, and distributors, um, and even retailers had uh, take back obligations. Um, so again, these were the three uh, focuses. Um, and then the third, um, and again, the one that's nearest and dearest to my heart is the, the payment of the recyclable materials collectors um, for environmental services provided uh, to society, um, you know, and, and for the separation of the waste recycling. Um, the municipalities have, have stepped up and have implemented waste selective collective programs um, with participating uh, collectors cooperatives. Um, each city had four years roughly to meet the PNRS recommendations um, and started in 2014. Um, you know, over the last uh, six years, the, the government has said that the, the basics or the basic intentions of the first set of regulations has been met. Um, and now they're moving on and, and expanding from there. Um, it is part of the PNRS, and I want to go back to the, the collectors. Um, there were some very specific things written into the law um, around the associations of recyclable materials uh, that they had to be self-managed. And I think this is pretty important. Um, you know, given that there are more than a million waste pickers in Brazil, the law was thoughtful enough to say, uh, you know, you couldn't just take the, the categories over or put in management or go around them or replace them. Um, it was thoughtful in the sense that it said, the, the programs or initiatives, according to the regulation, had to support the informal sector. And I think that was, uh, you know, again, a very thoughtful piece. Um, you know, I want to just share a little bit of a timeline. And again, I'll talk through this. Um, you know, believe it or not, the discussion on the PNRS started in 1991. Um, and then was signed and approved in 2010. So, you know, quite a, uh, a, quite a bit of discussion on this topic. Uh, state plans, municipality plans, and then sectoral uh, reverse logistics systems started in, in 2012 and were completed in 2013, and I'll go through those. And then in 2014, the, it was agreed that the elimination of dumps would begin. Um, as far as sectoral agreements, uh, first came the lubricant oil packaging in 2013, uh, fluorescent lamps in 2014, uh, general packaging in 2015, uh, which was great, more than a thousand companies joined. Um, and by the end of 2017, uh, again, in general, the targets were met and they're now negotiating phase two. And now, and most recently, um, and I saw Circular Brain join the conversation not too long ago, uh, medicines and electronics and e-waste were added to the sectoral agreements and signed in 2020. Um, in closing, um, there was, there's a lot of challenges to implementation. Uh, number one was how to enforce. Uh, number two is the regulations that impose additional burdens, requirements to licensing legality, who's actually responsible, the seller, the retailer, the licensee. Um, potential lawsuits and inquiries uh, became an issue. 
um, how to meet the targets, uh, quantitative and qualitative, and then again, the role of the Katadoris, um, the various methodologies that arose from interpretations of the regulation has become an issue, and then the different systems um, that were proposed and adopted. Um, and then finally, um, and the last challenge has been how do you integrate the municipalities into the schemes and, and or are they indemnified? You know, where does the true responsibility lie? Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and let us move on. Thanks, Mike. That's a very good introduction to the national service and policy. Uh, I mean, the framework seems to be very comprehensive from what you've explained, and it seems to be very mature. Uh, and thanks for mentioning some of the challenges as well. We will get back to you on those challenges because we would like to know more on how you're Great. tackling them and what are the main issues and what others can learn from it. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and uh, now we'll move ahead to Chile. Uh, so we have Rodrigo with us, Rodrigo Newman. He's the environmental consultant at Valorisa Environmental Advisor. Rodrigo also has uh, over two decades of experience in waste management, which started in France at Veolia. He's been part of uh, several national policies. He's worked with different sectors. And in Chile, especially, he's been working with the Chilean government and the Chilean EPR since its inception in 2010. Uh, he has been advising government and industrial bodies on the implementation of EPR in Chile. And uh, he is an expert in EPR and product stewardship best practices. And he's, he's part of several international organizations and professional organizations, including the International Solid Waste Association, and is the permanent member of its working group on governance and legal issues. Uh, thank you very much, Rodrigo, for joining today. And we look forward to hearing from you from the Chilean experience. Uh, Rodrigo, you're on mute. Uh, uh, Rodrigo, I think you've turned off your camera. Yes. Yeah, Just, yeah no, it's fine. Okay. Here we go. So, good morning and good afternoon, wh wherever you are. Um, I'm very happy to, to share this uh, uh, webinar with, with, with you and with other speakers. Um, okay. Can you, can you see the screen? Uh, which one? Which one? Yes, Rodrigo. We can see the screen. I can't advance the slides. Um, we are seeing the first slide. Yeah. Okay. Now we do. So today uh, I will give you a very general overview about the Chilean EPR law framework, and we'll go more into details into the specific decree law for packaging. Chile passed this law framework in 2016 to reduce waste generation and to promote waste recovery. The EPR model is one of the ways we plan to achieve this, and this EPR model deals with six priority products. Tires, packaging, batteries, car batteries, youth soil, and we. This law will be made operational through specific decrees relates to recovery targets and the rules of operation for PROs. In Chile, the environmental agency is legally required to implement the law, and they have been given the specific legal powers to help them do this. Right now, the environmental agency is developing several standards that will require producers to improve their environmental performance regarding products they place in the market. So far, the focus has been on implementing the EPR model for tires and packaging. Regarding the specific case of the packaging decree law, it is important to mention that as part of the different decrees to make operational this EPR law, we have a specific decree that establishes how to elaborate the decree laws for priority products. In this chart, you can see the different stages it considered. The first draft with an economic and social impact analysis, 
than a public and private committee to discuss and share opinions about different topics regarding packaging waste, a public consultation, and finally, a decree proposal elaborated by the environmental agency that was already approved by the Council of Ministers. The decree proposal was already released and we hope it will be enacted in a few weeks, being published in the official newspaper. It establishes 30 month deadline for producers to start meeting the targets. Therefore, it is estimated that the respective PROs will be operating at the beginning of 2023. As you can see, there are separate targets for household and industrial packaging. Regarding household packaging, we have been quite ambitious. Chile is, in 10 years, is planning to be pretty close to the EU targets. Several individual and collective PROs could be set up, non-for-profit and producer full responsibility. For PROs, the decree established minimum number of drop-off points that must be set up throughout the country according to a specific rule and a timeline. On the other hand, the decree also defines a rule for PROs to set up a selective curbside collection service to ensure that in 2034, 80% of the country will be covered by this service. The packaging decree law makes reference to color standards for waste recycling bins already established in 2013. The decree defines the color yellow for bins or bags if are used for different mixed materials, including plastic. The targets are credited only with recycling of packaging as raw materials. Therefore, recycling plants must certify as recycling what is actually used as raw materials in the process. The decree introduced as an obligation eco-design criteria to set up the PRO's fees. The PRO's should consider bonuses and penalties in terms of the complexities that the, cap the packaging presents regarding its collection and effective recycling and the use of recycled materials. On the other hand, to provide consumers with a tool to select the products they buy in terms of their packaging eco-design, the industry and the environmental agency in a joint effort are working to establish an eco-level that will be used on a packaging only when it is certified as highly recyclable. The PROs and in, as in many EPR regulations have obligations related to submit a work plan and to inform. Among these obligations, PROs must specify and inform fees, eco-modulation, modulation criteria, bonuses and penalties, and submit a waste speaker's formalization plan. Regarding benefits for producers, what is interesting in this decree law is that producers may present projects to reduce the amount of packaging material they place on the market. If a project is approved, the environmental agency will grant a benefit, reducing the obligation to recycle in proportion to the redu reduction of packaging materials. The law is very specific about how we speakers are treated and what they are legally allowed to do. Chile is using VPR law as an opportunity to help one of the poorest part of the workforce to really benefit through their own efforts and contributions. Chile is formalizing the role of voice speakers and establishing them as a self-managed group that is empowered within the system. Formalization means that voice speakers become authorized waste contractors. They have recognized certifications and work 
to their formal trade standards. It also means that they operate as real businesses, paying taxes, obeying health and safety regulations, and being responsible employers. Despite the fact that PROs have a full responsibility, they may enter into agreements with municipalities. In, the, in that case, municipalities can assume the responsibility for the selective curbside collection, sorting sites operation, and implement awareness campaigns. Thank you, Vishwas. I give you back the word. Thank you, Rodrigo. That was a very interesting presentation. Again, Chile seems to have a very holistic uh, uh, plan as well. And it's good to know that you have the eco-labeling schemes. You have a slightly different version or the traditional version of EPR where you have the full responsibility for PROs. And uh, we would like to discuss more about the implementation of, of these rules and how they've turned out in Chile. Uh, but we'll get back to you again very shortly. Uh, now we move on to Argentina. Uh, for a presentation by Carolina Palacio from Viego. Carolina works for the Argentinian Base Pickers Federation in the Union of Popular Economy Workers called UTEP in, in Spanish. She is the coordinator of the international relationships of Viego and at the same time also works with the team of Global Alliance of Waste Pickers. She has a major in philosophy and has been working in the sector for over a decade. Thank you very much, Carolina, for uh, being here today. And we look forward to hearing from you from the Argentinian perspective. Thank you, Vishwa. Thank you for that introduction, for, for you to, uh, to introduce me as a, because I'm, a, I'm also a, a militant of the Waste Pickers Federation in Argentina. And that is something that, for you to note because I am bringing the, the, the situation of the EPR policies in Argentina related to the relationship with, with uh, waste pickers themselves. So I'm gonna share my screen. Give me a second. So I wanted to have that in, in your background for you to know the perspective at least. Okay, EPR policies in Argentina. I'm going to make a, a, a general a background on the situation of EPR. Then I'm going to bring the urgent claims from voice speakers in Argentina. Uh, well, they have asked me to do it uh, on, the, on the COVID crisis uh, and, the, and the beforehand problems that voice speakers had. And then a perspective on the post pandemia for us to be bringing and reflecting on. So, so we cannot. I can't pass the slide. Uh, you can click on the slide, it should be. Oh, you're right. Thank you, it was easier than I thought. <laughs> Thank you. All right. So we have a general situation on EPR and it has a very long history of 26 years of discussions on EPR with no agreements. Uh, why the no agreements? Because we need a lot of political will to make a think corporations about the responsibility that they have among different situations. Uh, at the beginning, I think the, the, for the, only for the past six years, the, the perspective changed into a more social one. But at the beginning, there was a lot of discussions around uh, eco-designing and the responsibilities towards that. So these uh, bullet points that I made are on the, on the discussions on the last six years. So please, I'm not bringing the whole history about it because it's a very long one. So there are three different ones by now, three different perspectives on the general situation and discussions around EPR. One is the main corporate proposals on creating an NGO, what here they are called Sistemas Integrados de Gestión, um, that, that it might be the PRO that you are talking about, PROs that you're talking about. Uh, that manages the recycling. They include incineration and energetic recovery mechanisms for the packagings that are not included into the, uh, into the recycling industry by now in Argentina. Then we have the waste pickers proposal with a major or stronger involvement of the state in controlling the funds allocated for recycling and eco-design. And it prohibits incineration because it's, a, it's like a, a 
parallel competition towards uh, towards the work of waste pickers do and the state of situation that we have here in Argentina. If we bring incineration into the discussion, uh, of course, we will bring a lot of um, problems around social health, but at the same time, it will bring us um, competition for waste pickers. Like we are very worried about uh, bringing incineration into different municipalities because they will just choose incineration because it brings like this magic solution for, for things that need to be coped into a different uh, situation. And then uh, there are some proposals with a mix of the two options. We can talk about that later of the mix of the two options. With the waste pickers uh, perspective, the mix of the two options are not possible because once you bring competition for waste pickers, they will be on a much more vulnerable position for them to get formalized into the, into the waste management uh, with social inclusion. So the two options are not a possibility for them. Then I'm going to talk about the urgent claims of, of waste pickers by now in Argentina. Uh, I did this on the, on, the, on the context that we are suffering by now due to the, to the COVID pandemic. So now we do have a national decree uh, with mandatory social distancing and essential services where waste pickers are included in its article six in, in their point 16. So they are allowed to work. They are recognized as an essential service, but in many different situations or municipalities, they don't see it as, as essential because, uh, well, they might find a lot of inability to work, especially in dump sites. Despite being accepted uh, due to lack of previous recognition, uh, they are not able to work. So we are finding a lot of, a lot of inability to work. Then uh, there is a, a shortage of materials to provide supplies, especially in the cardboard and plastic industry, to the food, hygienic and pharmaceutical industry. So related to that, we had, a, we had during this, for the past three or four months, we had a, a lot of uh, support from those, uh, from those industries for us to go back to work. And then there, was, there were some special claims towards that, that they were um, a very new and interesting alliance uh, from the, the, well, the, those industries towards the waste pickers. <clears throat> At the same time, we are, we are finding, of course, an environmental crisis with dam sites collapsing because they are sending more materials to the dam sites. So then the municipalities are, are reconsidering, reconsidering the, the, the work that the, that the waste pickers do. At the same time, we are living a social crisis because inability to access to the only source of waste pickers uh, for waste pickers livelihood that there are the recycling materials brings a situation much more vulnerable and making the population of waste picker sector more poor, of course. Then there is a, from the organized waste pickers co-ops, uh, co there is a special claim for a national inclusive recycling emergency plan to face the current crisis and the post pandemic crisis. And this brings us to talk about the perspective on the post pandemia this National Inclusive Recycling Emergency Plan <clears throat> have, has three different points uh, that are very important. One is developing a national census of waste pickers in order to be recognized in their work to access social protection, social salary, bancarization, and to get a wider comprehension of the different realities within the sector. Then, we are asking investment in infrastructure in order to improve differentiated recollection and classification of materials, sorting centers, trucks, balers, carts, PPE, etc. Provision of safety and hygiene elements so that we can develop the activity according to the necessary protocols to minimize risk, risks of, of infection for the waste pickers and for the, for the people who are getting their recyclables collected. And then um, the claim is for a commercialization network in order to increase the level of recovery and processing of recyclable materials and to ensure fairer prices for waste pickers. 
the collecting materials need to reach the industry in the large urban centers. How is the plan going to be funded? And then this brings us back to an EPR, an inclusive EPR uh, law, a national packaging law. Here in Argentina, the EPR, the Extended Producer Responsibilities uh, Laws, are um, specially targeted to be a national packaging laws, so related to packaging themselves. So an inclusive EPR system that guarantees and finances waste pickers work in its whole for the continuity of recycling as a fundamental part of the circular economy. So that is that it does not enter into crisis again in the future. So what what I was trying to say or bring with the with the with this type of presentation is that uh, ensuring uh, an inclusive EPR in Argentina it will bring a stronger municipal waste management collections that includes of course because they are the ones the collecting the 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 packagings that the corporations are not able to to recover themselves the waste pickers are doing it so the perspective of an inclusive EPR it might bring the the discussion about externalities and how how does the big corporations need to internalize the cost that they are that they are doing we're talking about what is called in, in in environmental speeches about free riders like and they might say and there is a there is a a discussion about who are the free riders you might say that the in a in a corporate in a in this type of corporate uh, perspectives the free riders free riders might be the the way speakers and from the waste pickers perspective, the free riders might be the, the corporations that they are not internalizing the costs that the waste pickers are bringing into their own lives, into their own bodies, into their, their own organizations. So these are some perspectives about how the EPR uh, policies are, are, are being discussed in Argentina. The waste, pick, the waste Pickers Federation here in Argentina are having a strong allies within the, the environmental organizations. So we do have a lot of support of, the, of, their, own, of their own claims as well, uh, because they are the same ones, <laughs> we know. Uh, luckily now in Argentina and around the world within the, the youth movement around climate change, there are lots of much more awareness than the than what it was uh, environmentalism during the 90s that was towards you know, other type of uh, perspectives in, in environmentalism that were not including uh, the social aspects about who are the ones that are you know, <laughs> the free riders in, its, uh, in each perspective. So we, might, we are very positive that now, or optimistic, sorry, about what can be the, the inclusiveness of waste pickers into different policies by now. And at the same time, we are finding a lot of strength in our organizations to fight back for EPR policies that are not inclusive with waste pickers. So that might be something that it could be a, a critique that we don't have an EPR policy by now, but still we are not having the EPR policy that we need. So I am going to leave it by now. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Carolina. That was that was very interesting to know, uh, and we really hope that you know, uh, like as you mentioned, inclusive EPR. I really like the terminology. We hope Argentina will have an inclusive EPR very soon. And uh, we are very glad that you know you're working, uh, the, and the Waste Federation is working on making this happen in Argentina. We'll get back to you uh, shortly with all the questions. Uh, just a gentle reminder to everyone: you can post your questions in the Q&A section. Uh, so I'll just pick some questions and start posting them. Maybe the first one to Alejandro. Uh, I think there are two questions. One is uh, uh, you mentioned about hazardous waste right household hazardous waste and how epr has been implemented uh, there's a question from lawrence uh, from france uh, who runs a P pro uh, for collection of uh, this used sharp objects from i assume it's from hospital waste 
So uh, is there any, are there any learnings from Colombia on successful implementation of EPR for this particular kind of waste? That's the first question. And the second question is uh, also you mentioned about how the EPR in Colombia was traditionally aligned towards the hazardous waste. And uh, the informal sector has been doing the packaging waste collection. And now the new law has included packaging under EPR. So have they been integrated? Uh, okay, well, uh, around the first question, really, uh, the medical, the medical uh, waste and the biological uh, waste uh, have, a, have a specific laws around uh, around the uh, hazardous uh, characteristics and uh, the decree that the uh, the decree uh, that uh, I was mentioning uh, call and uh, create a, a management system for these uh, specific uh, um, types or, or, or waste but the problem is that some ways that they uh, have the possibility for to for, to create value as I don't know as plastics uh, elements without contact with, with the with, with the patients uh, for this doubt now uh, really is is a is a very very avoid now this <laughs> is a prevent now prevent risk now uh, it is not possible to use or, or, or to circle these materials we, we have a, a, a very big discussions around it with with the, with the uh, environmental authority in Colombia because uh, some kind of these uh, material mental waste uh, without contact with patients uh, has a, a good material for for uh, as a raw material in a new process in, in the in the first question in the second question well um, I, 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 uh, saw, I saw that the, the, uh, the situation is uh, in the EPRs laws in, in, in Colombia, we are working, I, I told you, uh, around waste and special uh, waste. The, the, the uh, rec recyclable materials, the, the paper, the plastic, the aluminum uh, and others uh, have a, a as, uh, value chains uh, uh, and the waste pickers uh, are working very hard uh, with, with, with their hands for 15, 60, 60 70 years uh, around this. The problem and the challenge now is with the EPRs in packaging, we have to put all words in the same place. And we, we, we have a, a, a big uh, situation because no, not all the, the uh, cooperatives or, or all the neural companies of was, uh, wage speakers uh, have the possibility for to create uh, the process that they allow um, um, our, our, uh, our sustain or our, um, I don't know. The law requires. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and it's a big problem because in the in the in the next year, uh, the, the 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 packaging law uh, will begin at uh, the last day of this year. In the next year, we have to to create uh, creative forms for to put the waste pickers, put the cooperatives, put uh, the 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 natural and traditional uh, uh, value chains, and the requirements of the laws. Uh, and that is, uh, at this moment, all the people are working around it and, and it's a uh, uh, big, big, uh, big question for, for the way speakers in, in, in Colombia. Really. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Alejandro. I really hope that works because the informal sector has been so active in Colombia, at least in the packaging sector. We hope the integration is successful and you know the process doesn't get hampered. Uh, thanks for answering these questions. Uh, my next question is for Mike. Uh, Mike, uh, so in there are two questions again for you. One is um, uh, we have we have a question here which asks about household waste collection. You know, has has this been integrated in the EPR? Because we understand that the commercial waste is slightly easier because you have a lot of quantities. But has the household waste been integrated? And uh, the second question is, uh, in Brazil, have you had problems with, I don't know, double counting of tab tax receipts or you know, companies meeting their targets or have the recycling goals been met? Maybe you can throw some light on that. 
Sure, sure. I'll, I'll start with the second one. Um, you know, because the, the, although the regulation I think is, was very thoughtful um, in the way that it was written, it was also written very broadly. Um, and, and part of it being written very broadly is there's broad interpretation of how to, how to meet or respond to the regulation. Uh, so therefore, yes, there has been quite a few issues with double counting, triple counting. Um, the federal government is trying to get their arms wrapped around this. Uh, one of the issues um, that, that has arisen is um, the, the fastest response, I would say, has been through the trade associations. Um, again, they have a very good outreach because most brands of most sectors belong to one trade association or another. Um, they formed a group first around Sempre, uh, now around Qualazown. Um, and as part of this, uh, they built credit-based systems. Um, and the credit-based systems are, are very simple. And again, I think the, the spirit was right um, to start there because that was a, a guaranteed point where the, the material that was sold from a cooperative could be tracked um, to its first sale. Um, and then what the trade associations do is they buy that tax receipt, which demonstrates one sale. Um, and then they load the volume into their database. And then that's how they track the, the credit base. The issue is it doesn't track beyond that. Um, and again, I spoke a little bit about the reverse logistics and how important that is. Um, you know, the, the, we, can, we can have a, a small joke to say, well, the tax receipt goes this way the waste can still go right into the ocean because they're not connected to each other anymore. Um, so, so now the, the second uh, phase of the regulation or the latest, um, and again, it's slowed down a little bit because of the pandemic, they're starting to talk about the full supply chain and how they, they do true reverse logistics. So ultimately, who gets credit? Uh, the person who buys the tax receipt or the person who buys the waste? Um, so again, I think that's something that they're coping with today. Um, as far as household uh, waste, it wasn't specifically written in to the um, to the regulation, at least again in the first iteration, um, because again the focus was on the extended producer, um, not the extended user. Um, so a lot of the um, uh, the user waste or household waste, um, it's making it back out either through municipal collection or collection. Uh, from the by the Cotadores and and making its way back into the recycling process and system, but it wasn't specifically written into the national solid waste policy. Okay, and and what about the targets? Have the targets uh, that have been set by the law have they been met by the companies? In the so 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 again, met is a pretty big word. Um, so they they fundamentally have been met in the packaging uh, sectoral agreements uh, through the credit based system. Um, so I think the second generation will be um, you know has the recycling and recovery rate actually changed? Um, and I think they're comparing that today to you know what's happening through the credit based system. Um, is the credit based system doing some good? Sure, it's definitely. Uh, getting more money funneled into the cooperatives. Um, is it solving the whole problem? Probably not. So that's where I think the shift will come is when they start looking at the actual recovery numbers and have they changed because of the credit system? And if they haven't, then what needs to be done next? Great, thank you. Uh, my next question is for Rodrigo. Uh, so, Rodrigo, there are two questions again. Uh, firstly, what are the main challenges that you see? Because we saw a very nice policy in place. So, what are the main challenges? And the second question related to it uh, from Taylor. So, uh, Taylor is asking about challenges of integrating the informal, informal sector in Chile and EPR. Okay, regarding by speakers, uh, I think. Uh, we have been working uh, with uh, with speakers uh, during the whole process to set up the, this P EPR law. Uh, the problem is uh, some waste speakers are not participating in waste speakers organizations, so it's not really easy to uh, ar arrive to them and to uh, make them part of of, of those discussions. But I can say that uh, the 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 Chilean state and their agencies have been. Uh, including uh, uh, in a permanent uh, uh, time uh, all 
all or, uh, white speakers organizations and we we uh, establish a, a policy for inclusion for white speakers and we have a very strong uh, system to push white speakers to be certified because the law will oblige uh, white speakers uh, that we want to participate to be certified and because we need to to evolve because Chile isn't the way to be a developed country and we must consider this community to help them to give tools uh, to allow them uh, to become uh, waste contractors. Mm -hmm. So I understand that some of white speakers could not be very happy because some companies some people are not really happy because they were working in a very comf comfortable way and and we need to increase our recycling rates we are now uh, uh, near 12 or 13 percent and we need to go further uh, and uh, uh, but i think i i pretty uh, 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 sure that uh, the system that we implemented for for white speakers to be part of the of this challenge uh, uh, will have success. Mm. And regarding Thank you. Uh, what is the other question? Yeah, the no, the next question I had was a general question. It was more about uh, the process of setting up PROs and who does the data tracking and who pays for this uh, pays for all the service. Uh, and you mentioned something about the equal labeling scheme. So is that somehow linked to the payment of fees for for the services? The eco label, eco label, or so first one was about the PRO and the data management. So is there a system in place? And second one was regarding the eco labeling. Okay, now there are some big challenges. PROs are now in a setting up process because they have some some time to be operational and how to track information how to manage information information is part of their big challenges mm, because those systems must be uh, implemented mm. so we don't have those systems now but uh, the decree law established that uh, we have we need to have a very accurate management of the information mm. so that is uh, uh, something that is now in 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 progress mm. Uh, and uh, about the big challenges, uh, what is really a, a big challenge is to educate and to raise awareness in households to have an adequate packaging waste sorting at home. That is something that uh, uh, needs a, a lot of attention from all stakeholders. Mm -hmm. And the other big challenge is uh, that we need to uh, implement to build a lot of sorting sites throughout the country because now we don't have sorting sites and we will implement a curbside, selective curbside collection and this volume of packaging waste need to be sorted. And uh, I think we have two years to, to implement, to build a lot of sorting sites. Mm. Thank you, Rodrigo. I mean, that's also very ambitious uh, mm. to have a full law in place. And, you know, I understand the infrastructure is yet to be built, mm. but it's very interesting to, um, you know, follow up this and how it turns out in Chile. Mm. Uh, the, next, the next question is for Carolina. Uh, Carolina, we have a question from uh, Cecilia. So it, what would be your recommendation maybe for other EPR laws in, in other countries on inclusion of waste pickers, if if you have something to recommend, what would it what would be the, be the key point? Well, I don't have an exhaustive list. Hola, Ceci. <laughs> this is so weird to be talking in English with the, with you and others. <laughs> and, all, and all of the Latin Americans here. Sorry, sorry to say, but it's <laughs> it's difficult. Yeah. But at the same time, um, what we always think of the of, uh, within the the federation of of way speakers in Argentina is that <clears throat> we don't have and maybe related to what Rodrigo was saying now like the difficulties or the challenges that the different uh, way speakers associations groups or individuals to be organized so I believe that if you have strong uh, way speakers organization you will have you you will need to you will need to address to them and ask them what is the way of of, of being integrated there are no EPR laws uh, why, uh, 
copied from one to, to the other. They shouldn't be copied. They, they, they all need to have a, a, the, the national context that they have in, in that, they, that, that you have in, a, in, the, in your own national context, of course. So what I would say that the basic is to have a, um, a dynamic and permanent census of way speakers, organizations, and groups, a national one, a national census and registration for them. Uh, you need that as well as the, as well as the, the, the registration for the, for the private sector, you know. We always uh, claim for what we call a co-administration of, of, um, of all the funds that are, are going to be, you know, uh, derived to the, to the, to the, for that current of, of, of uh, funding from the, from the corporations. So, then the co-administration between the between the the government or the state and the and the way speakers and the producers it's something that you need to you need to be assessing it's a it might be i'm not sure if this is a, what everybody talks about shared responsibility but i think this is something that they need to but still uh, we are thinking of a of a tax less than a voluntary you know um well, a mandatory tax, of course, but not voluntary, vol voluntary, you know, um, schemes of, of, of EPR. So then will be census co-administration of the of the funds, and uh, that might be that might be it. That might be it, uh, because if you are finding or if you are always having a, a permanent voice and transparent and transparent mechanisms of 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 dealing with with the with the well the the garbage that <laughs> needs to be recycled, then we, it will be the the way of it might be it might sign it might sound naive because what we are finding is that plenty of EPR mechanisms are so difficult, but you might we might need to think simpler than we are thinking on EPR on EPR schemes. There are plenty of what we see technical complications around it and it's there, there is something something suspicious about the, the 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 lot of challenges that you need that you need to be or, or complexities that you need to be um, watching around the different EPR mechanisms that they are find around the world that it's something that we are a little bit skeptic about so it's much simpler than than we are than we are you know always trying to uh, study or investigate or research on it no that's there's some good insights thank you thank you very much carolina uh, we have actually a lot of questions coming in uh, and thank you for the questions but you know we are running out of time so but then we will get back to you with answers we'll post them to the panelists and we'll get back to the answer to the with the answer for the questions uh, i want to thank carolina mike alejandro and rodrigo for being on the panel and it was an excellent webinar uh, thank you very much we hope to continue engaging and learn more from you in the future thanks to shweta and be waste twice for organizing this webinar uh, as you see you know the panorama of waste management and is changing very rapidly in latin america and uh, yeah we hope it all moves in the good direction thanks shweta over to you Thank you, Vishwas. Uh, thank you to all the panelists and uh, thanks a lot for actually putting this panel together in English, though I understand that you'll be speaking to each other in English might be a little odd for uh, Rodrigo, Alejandro and Carolina. I totally understand that. Thanks for our benefit that you spoke in English. And uh, to the audience, we will, if you have any more questions apart from what has come up in the Q&A section already, please feel free to drop us an email at connect at uh, wastewise.de and uh, we will get the responses from the panelists and we will get you the answers when the panel goes up on our website. So uh, thanks a lot to everyone. And uh, just a reminder to uh, the audience members in the early part of September, we have another panel coming up, which Emma Burlow is going to be moderating. So do sign up to our newsletter. You will receive updates about it. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.